In 1921, a 13-year-old girl named Chrissy Venn went missing after she left her rural home to walk to the nearby village of North Motton in Tasmania. Her mutilated body was later found close to the road she would have been travelling down, but tragically, no one was ever convicted of her gruesome murder. What makes this tale a horror story is that Venn is still said to haunt that stretch of road nearly a hundred years later. Locals have reported paranormal activity at the spot where her body was found, and legend has it that cars still stall or shudder on Allison's road without explanation, while drivers have reported hearing terrifying screams coming from the bush as they pass, seeing apparitions and axes floating by the side of the road, and there's even been reports of people picking up a young girl hitchhiking only to have her disappear from the car. If you like your stories full of intrigue, whodunit and unexplained true horror, then you made it. True Horror Podcast is all that. Pull up your bed covers, turn off the light, and get ready to hear the bizarre, the mortifying, and supernatural tales where you decide if there's truth in what you hear. One of the most captivating things about researching the paranormal is the backstories. This cold case was no exception. There were so many things I would have liked to have made sense of, but because the murder took place in 1921, it made it challenging. But I do believe what I did discover was definitely intriguing. While the reporting of ghost stories does have consistency and the various sightings are compelling, and even now, almost 100 years since the murder, there are still reports that Chrissy Venn haunts Allison Road in North Motton in Tasmania, Australia. What I did actually find really interesting, though, was the circumstances surrounding Chrissy Venn's murder and the unsolved case. It ended up being more fascinating to me than the ghost stories themselves. So for now, I want to talk about the case before I get into the tale of the young girl who haunts Allison Road. The mystery surrounding Chrissy Venn's death is still an unsolved cold case that is now approaching a hundred years, yet it seems her spirit still haunts the very spot her half-naked body was stuffed into a tree stump. Yes, you heard that right. It was around 7 p.m. on a hot summer's day in late February 1921 when Eva May Venn started to become concerned about the whereabouts of her daughter Chrissy. Earlier that afternoon, Eva had sent her then 13-year-old daughter on an errand into town from her home in North Motton. It was a chore she had undertaken numerous times, and so Eva had little reason to worry when she'd sent her on her way. However, Chrissy had never taken this long before, so after a brief walk along the road herself, where Chrissy would have gone, Eva decided it was time to contact the authorities. At approximately 5 p.m. on the Herp Farm, a neighboring property, a piercing scream was heard in the valley. John Earp Jr. and his brother Thomas were working in their father's fields. John looked up, waited a moment, but as it was a singular scream, the boy decided he was probably mistaken. When nothing else was heard, he continued his chores and never went down the road to investigate. Next door to Herb's farm was another farm owned by William George King, who at the same time was tending to his pigs. It was late in the afternoon and he remembered that, even though he didn't even have a watch on, he estimated the time to be between 4 and 4.30 p.m. when two young men flew by on a motorbike. He didn't recognize them exactly, but he figured them to be two local lads he did know. As he continued to work on his farm on his day off, several more motorists passed by, including another local man on horseback. King recognized all of them as other locals living in the area. 
At around 6 p.m., William headed inside as the sunset blared its brilliant colors across the fields and mountains of the valley. When King was later washing up from his work on the farm, his wife Lily noticed the scratches on his right hand were looking red and fresh. Lily then touched the side of his face where there were more scratch marks. His wife fussed for a moment and asked him how he got them. William couldn't hide the marks, but he explained that he cut them from the bracken when looking for his wife's favorite pig who had escaped once again and had headed to the waterfall close by. His wife shrugged her shoulders with understanding and then went about setting the table for dinner while William finished cleaning up himself. Later that evening, as William and Lily were about to go to bed, there was a small knock at their front door. It was the chief of the police station, and he had come to meet with King, who was a former policeman. For the past two hours, Chief Detective Oakes had been called out to investigate the now missing child, Chrissy Venn. Oakes explained that the very next day, Detective Fred Harmon from Davenport would be called down and would be bringing help so that they could widen their search in the daylight. Detective Oakes asked King a few questions and noticed the scratches on his face and right hand. William explained again the reasoning behind them and offered his help in the search the following day. The next day, the search party began and dozens of individuals scoured the surrounding area, hoping to find the missing teenager, but without success. It was at 11.30 a.m. on Tuesday, March the 1st, 1921 that the search was underway in a deep ravine about half a mile from Chrissy's home. It was adjacent to the field owned by John Herps Sr. One of the searchers, in fact, was John Herps Jr., the same young man who had heard the scream on the day of the murder. He had the idea to look inside one of several immense tree stumps scattered through the area, remnants of locals logging massive eucalypts and pine trees in the dense wood. This apparently prompted another searcher to climb a different stump, which also proved fruitless, but in doing so he spotted another, not very far away, and decided to look in that. The charred stump was 33 feet round, over 9 feet high, and had a 16 inch wide hollow through the middle. This time the search came to an end. Chrissy Venn's body had somehow been stuffed, head first down this narrow hole. At the bottom of the hole under Chrissy's body was the basket she'd been carrying and her handkerchief. A bottle that had been in the basket, a cap and Chrissy's underclothing, the small amount of money her mother had given her, was missing. Had this been a robbery, or was it the unfortunate event of a brutal, mortifying death of a young girl? What was even more shocking were the details of the murder. Twisted tightly around her throat was a piece of hay baling wire about a foot in length. She'd also had a portion of her white dress she'd been wearing that day with a brooch attached stuffed down her throat and this believed to have been the cause of her death by suffocation. Though the newspapers of the time were very coy about reporting such things and the court records indicated that Chrissy had been actually sexually violated and sperm was found in her vagina. It was obvious to the coroner that Chrissy had fought for her life with evidence of a terrific struggle both on her body and in an area about 12 yards from the stump, where it was to be believed that the attack on her had occurred. It was where they had found a quantity of blood-stained, short, pubic hair the same colour as Chrissy's, some safety pins, pieces of bloody cotton fabric used as a sanitary pad also found was a blood-stained stick. A nearby gate that led to the field owned by the Herps family proved to be the source of the wire around Chrissy's throat, as portions of wire from the gate had also been recently cut. While everyone in the residing area of Allison Road were questioned about the murder and their whereabouts on that day, suspicion completely fell immediately 
on William George King. The evidence stacked up against him with with the scratches on his eye and his arm all pointed to the evidence that something strange had happened and every time he was questioned, his story would change. What was interesting at the time was that the Herps the closest farm, none of the suspicion fell on John Herps Sr. or his sons. Another person who was believed to be under suspicion was the neighbour to the Venn's farm, Charles Purton. He stated he had been out ploughing his field on the Saturday afternoon Chrissy vanished. He remembered seeing the young girl walking along Allison Road, which headed into town and it was approximately at 5pm. What's interesting is that Charles Purton is actually believed by some of his own descendants to be a suspect in the murder. While Purton was on Allison Road the day Chrissy was murdered and was a witness at the trial during which he was asked some very interesting questions by the defending counsel. But adding to reasons for him becoming a popular point of interest is that he apparently vanished in 1944, never to be seen again. This making it a very interesting fact more than 20 years after her death that people were still believing that Charles Purton could very well have been the murderer. But at the time, Purton, like many others, pointed the blame at William George King. King was well known to Chrissy's mother. Apparently he'd spent time at their house on several occasions staying late into the night. Many locals came forward to tell police that Chrissy had indeed been afraid of King and had taken to hiding from the man more recently, running into the bushes alongside the road whenever she saw him coming. King said he had no idea why she would have done such a thing, but police grew even more suspicious when King changed his story on several details of his alibi. While Chrissy was only 13 at the time and soon to be 14, She was described as well-developed for her age, her figure said to resemble that of a grown woman rather than a child. In fact, two years previously, at the age of 11, she'd brought a charge of rape against someone else. Chrissy's mother, who was born as Eva May Chilcott around 1881, and her father, George Arthur Venn, were six years younger than Chrissy's mum. He'd married Eva in 1906 at the age of 18, and Eva gave birth to Chrissy in July of 1907. It was in 1908 that George Venn apparently and arguably vanished off the face of the earth. Then Eva had another baby in August of that same year, this time a son. Eva claimed George had drowned at sea, but changed the dates and locations of his death on several official documents. She claimed on one document that they'd been married in 1901 and George had died in 1902, which would have made him 13 at the time. Yet it also states in family history notes that several people who knew George claimed to have seen him alive as late as 1917, and also suspect that Eva may never have actually lived with George, citing evidence of a man of the same name living in Somerset during the years they were married. This kind of sounds a little bit ludicrous, had Eva ever lived with her second husband, Francis Henry Dawes, whom she married in June 1913. But she didn't. For some reason, immediately after the wedding, she left him to live elsewhere, allegedly with her parents, but this is also debatable. Still, they had a daughter together in 1913, and by 1915, Eva was suing Frank for child maintenance. And here's where things get even stranger. It seems that Eva had not fled to her family home after her wedding, but to the North Motten home of her former husband's cousin, James Venn. She is listed as residing at this address in 1914. James had only recently married himself to a woman named Edith Ravel. They'd married around the same time that Eva married Frank and also had a child together in 1913. However, by 1914, Edith had left her husband and gone home to her own family and was going by her maiden name, Ravel. Now the story gets even more confusing. 
but in 1919, Edith had apparently moved back in with her husband. The correlation between Edith and Eva and Frank and James and her original husband, who's Chrissy's father, all seems rather vague and also at the same time very timed in, because the timing does suggest it may have been so. In 1919 was also the year that 11-year-old Chrissy was examined after being raped by somebody. It was in 1920 that Eva did have another child who was not fathered by Frank. And at the time of Chrissy's death in 1921, Eva was apparently living with a man named Llewellyn Warden and didn't bother telling her husband, who was still paying maintenance to her, as well as money for Chrissy's little sister. What's even more bizarre was that just two days before Chrissy was murdered, Edith, the wife of James Venn, apparently committed suicide. The body was discovered by another local woman and pinned inside the lapel of her jacket, containing a gold brooch and a letter that was addressed to Mr. J. Herps. It wasn't established whether this letter was addressed to John Herps Jr. or John Herps Sr. The letter stated to go to Jim, that would be James, her husband, he's in trouble. Do what you can to comfort him, but I must go. The coroner recorded that Edith Venn was found drowned in the East Ulverston Beach on February 24th, and the evidence produced would show that the deceased committed suicide while temporarily insane, and that the sheer unlucky coincidence that Edith was found dead just two days before Chrissy was murdered near the Herps farm, very strange. A year later, in 1922, Francis Henry Dawes finally divorced Eva, saying that he discovered Eva living in adultery with Llewellyn Warden. He also filed for custody of Chrissy's nine-year-old sister. Eva intended to marry Warden once her divorce was final, which she did and went on to have more children by him. The suspicion around Eva was never placed. In the likely event that something possibly did happen with all this history and her adultery and also the possibility that the person who had raped Chrissy two years before could possibly have been someone in Eva's life. And we must remember that the year was 1921 when this kind of behavior of having more than one partner or having affairs was probably kept very low key in the community of North Motton. Over the years since the discovery of Chrissy Venn, the details have become muddled. Some reports claim the young girl was badly mutilated, with some even going as far to say the tragic victim was decapitated. However, it does seem this may be greatly exaggerated. What we do know is that Chrissy's body had somehow been put in that tree hollow head first. It was established she had died of asphyxiation, it was unclear what exactly had caused her to suffocate though, and it was largely assumed a piece of her own clothing had been shoved forcibly into her mouth was definitely the cause of the suffocation. There was also a piece of hay baling wire that was tied around the girl's throat, though it was believed this was done after Chrissy was already dead and used to aid the moving of her body. There was evidence that Chrissy Venn had put up quite a struggle with her assailant and that the last hours of her life were conducted under such gruesome, horrifying details as being raped and murdered at the age of 13. While suspicion quickly fell on the local man George William King, he was in complete denial about any such suggestion. Although he wasn't part of the group that found the young girl, King was searching elsewhere with a different group at the time, but he was present when the victim's body was removed from the tree. It was then that locals noticed that King had several scratch marks and cuts upon his hands and face. In the witch hunt that followed, it led locals to question whether this could have come from a struggle with the deceased. Of course, King denied any such allegations and claimed that he got the injuries to his hands during the search where he said he tripped and fell over a log. However, he also later claimed 
they could have been the result of play fighting with his wife, which of course was a completely different story to the one he told his wife and the chief of police. Rumours quickly began to swirl that Chrissy Venn had been scared of King and that she had taken to hiding in bushes whenever she saw him approach. When the police asked King, he claimed he had no idea if this was true and if it was, he didn't know the reason behind it. On August 14, 1921, the trial of George William King began. Six days later, the jury returned a verdict. George William King was found not guilty of the murder of Chrissy Venn. In the days that followed the acquittal, heads rolled. The detective heading up the investigation was dismissed under the grounds of incompetence. It was reported that several good suspects were also dismissed without any further investigation or even having been interviewed due to his absolute belief in George William King being the murderer despite little in the way of evidence against the suspect. Likewise, the coroner had become something of a laughingstock thanks to his handling of the case. Several times over the course of the six months between the murder of Chrissy Venn and the trial of George William King, he had altered his findings. His utter incompetence made his testimony during King's trial worthless, but worse than that was his handling of the evidence. He had mislaid, failed to preserve, and in some cases not even collected key pieces of evidence, making any future arrests related to the case almost impossible. And sadly, that proved to be the case. Many stories have been told about the fate of William George King, and one of them is that he travelled around the state of Tasmania sharpening knives for households. According to the electoral rolls of 1928, there was a George King living in the town of Denison, whose occupation was listed as a fish agent. More common is the story that King changed his name after the trial. Yet another story is that King died in the Port Sorel area and is buried in Launceston. Once again, it is unsubstantiated. During the trial, though, there was a letter that was discovered in George William King's house with no signature and it simply read, Take care, I saw you murder Chrissy Venn, and if you don't confess, I'm going to tell the police. Inside the letter also contained a crude picture of a man hanging from the gallows. During the coroner's inquest, held on March the 26th, Detective Harmon stated that he had not found the author of the letter, but he had deducted it had been written by a woman. But by that stage, George William King had already been arrested for the murder of Chrissy Venn. Other than a confession made the following year that was easily disproven, no one else was ever named as a person of interest in the murder of Chrissy Venn. And despite being nationwide news during the early months of 1921, by year end, it was almost as if the tragic event had never taken place. For almost a hundred years, a ghostly girl haunts Allison Road in North Motton. Many strange tales have been told of the road. Cars stalling in strange places, apparitions and lights following cars, axes floating by the side of the road, and even picking up a girl only to have her disappear from the car. A coming-of-age tradition in the area is to go out to the stump at midnight and walk a lap of it. It is probably one of the most widely known and discussed ghost stories in Tasmania. And now I want to share with you a story that I created based on all of the ghost sightings on Allison Road, North Motton, Tasmania. Lockie and his mate Steve-O were getting ready for their shared 18th birthday party. Both lads were already drinking from the beer tap, geared up and rowdy even before any of their guests had arrived. With their families preparing the food and their sisters finishing off the decorations, the boys were really just wanting the party to get going. When their friends piled in at around 3pm, the house soon became full of life. 
In the open space of their backyard, it overlooked the valley and forest surrounding their property. The music blaring their favourite songs and a pool full of drunken bodies, the party reached its climax and by the evening everyone was ready to go out. It was well known that the tale of Chrissy Venn haunting Allison Road where she was killed was often linked to the suspicion that she was murdered by two young men. Possibly the Herp brothers and neighbouring property to the Venns. It was what locals still believed the most and why Chrissy always haunted teenagers, especially boys around the age of 18 years old. Lockie and Steve were pumped as they drank and danced their party away, knowing that in a few hours they would be doing what every teenager in the area would do when they turned 18. As the pub closed at midnight, those attending the ritual needed to leave no later than 11.45pm to get to the dip, the place where the murder had happened. An eeriness fell over their group of friends, each of them processing what they were doing. Due to them all being from a small country town, these friendships were close-knit due to their small community, and age never really was an issue. You either liked each other, or you didn't, and if you didn't, it would be a pretty lonely life. Some of the partygoers started heading out to the car park and getting into their cars, and while drink driving is a criminal offence in Australia, the person who was the least drunk was the designated driver. While both Lockie and Steve-O were jokingly fighting over who was going to do the honours, one of their other friends, a girl named Sarah, who both the boys liked, stepped in between them and announced she would be their driver tonight because she had been there several times before and had never seen anything. I call bullshit, Steve-O slurred a little from the umpteen beers he'd had under his belt. You've never seen anything, mate. Lockie draped his arm around Sarah and she didn't stop him. That's right, my friends, not even on my own 18th. Party pooper, Steve proclaimed, and he too tried to get closer to Sarah and leaned in for a kiss. Okay, you boys, you sure you wouldn't prefer to go home? Nah, wait, they both chorused, and they all piled in the car, and Sarah turned the engine on and it purred to life. As she was reversing, two other mates of the boys, Brendan and Brad, slammed their fists on the bonnet of the car and scared them all enough that everyone screamed. Tension was running high. The terrifying adventure that they were about to go on was starting to chill them, even tough little Sarah. Get in, Lockie yelled, and the other boys, full of their own drunken Dutch courage, shoved themselves into the back seat. Sarah eventually pulled out of the car park after stopping several times to relay to the rest of the gang that they were leaving now and to hurry up and decide who were the designated drivers for the remaining cars. The short 10 minute trip to Allison Road and the area of the murder was filled with stories of what the five passengers knew about the hauntings on that road. Look, I just don't believe any of them. They're just stories made up to prevent us young girls from walking along the road alone at night. Brad agreed with her but his twin brother Brendan was not so convinced. Come on, mate, you know it's true what Aunt Sheila told us about how her car stopped just before the stump and the lights turned off the engine wouldn't restart and she could hear the sound of scraping along the side of the passenger door as she sat alone in her car, terrified. Then suddenly it stopped. The lights and engine went back on and Sheila effing floored it out of there. The next morning when she came outside, she noticed scratch marks along the side of her car as if someone had scraped all five fingernails along the door. You can't tell me that's just a coincidence. The car fell silent. Not even his brother spoke. Each of the passengers closest to the windows turned their heads simultaneously and glazed over the trees lining the side of the road. Brendan remained in the middle of the back seat, staring blankly ahead, thinking of other stories he'd been told growing up. This, though, was the first time he would be going to the spot at night that all the locals talked about even after all these years. Sarah glanced at Brendan in the rearview mirror. Their eyes met and he gave her a smirk that said everything. She quickly looked over his head and was surprised that not a light in sight except their own car's taillights could be seen. There should be at least two more carloads of stragglers coming to join them. All of a sudden the car was out of control or had taken on a life of its own. 
The occupants, too scared to get out, remained crammed into the car. It seemed no one dared to scream. It was pitch black now since the engine had stalled, the only light, the almost full moon that bounced its reflection on the tarmac. This is happening because we have even numbers in the car, yelled Stevo, and without hesitation, he jumped out of the car and started running down the dark, deserted road. It was true, his house was opposite the old Venn farm, so it would only take a few minutes and he'd be home. But the others in the car began screaming at him to come back. Look, I'm going to take a look outside, okay? Lockie said as he opened the car door before anyone could disagree. Oi, do you have a torch in the boot? He yelled from the back of the car. Sarah popped the boot of the car open, but taking a deep breath, she also opened the door. Gripped with fear, she ran to Lockie, who had turned on her flashlight. Now the twins got out and joined the two of them at the back of the car, and the four bodies stood hovering over the boot, each shivering from the cold and the nervousness that was engulfing them. Sarah paced back and forth, partly to warm herself up, but mostly because she really needed to pee. Lucky kind of gave her a sideways glance, and then she stopped, knowing it was probably annoying him. Using the torch to guide them, Lockie first closed the boot lid, then went to the front of the car, the other three trailing behind him. Sarah, as cool as she normally was, also stayed close to Lockie. Lockie glanced down at her. You need to lift the bonnet, Lockie said, giving her a little wink to make her feel better. Sarah smiled faintly, ran to the driver's seat and unlatched the lever, and the bonnet clicked open. As soon as it was up, Lockie scanned over the engine, but nothing seemed unusual. Suddenly, the windscreen wipers jumped to life, frantically moving from side to side. All of them piled back into the car, hoping it would also start. The heater blasted a shot of hot air, and the radio was screaming some oldies tune. Bewildered but relieved, Lockie and Sarah shrugged their shoulders at their good fortune. Sarah turned the key, and the engine came on but everyone agreed they should look for Stevo. With no reluctance, Sarah turned the car around, but as she did, the car lights hit something that had everyone screaming again. Directly in front of the car, standing by the bonnet, was a teenage girl in a white dress. At first they thought it was an actual girl, but then she vanished. Poof, gone as quickly as she'd appeared. Sarah turned to the twins in the back. Their eyes were glued to the windscreen. Every single person in that car had seen something. The twins kept yelling, turn the car around, turn the car around. And that was when the AC turned on by itself. Lockie tried to turn it off, but couldn't. Every single occupant of Sarah's car was suddenly sober and in desperate need to get the hell out of there. On their way, they spotted Stevo running through the gate at his farm. At least he was safe. But each of them, they were too scared to go to their own homes and be in their beds alone. Sarah drove them straight to Macca's, and as they went through drive through the window to her car door wouldn't unwind and Sarah felt it was all somehow connected. Each of them agreed to go inside, eat their comfort food, and discuss if what happened was real, but then to never talk about what they saw again. Ever since that strange sighting of the little girl who haunts Allison Road, Sarah's car would break down randomly. She would take it to the mechanics and they'd say it should work, and it would, but then it would break down again. And the scratch marks would also reappear after removing them. Eventually she sold the car, exactly as it was. From the tale of a young girl who was raped and brutally murdered to the ghost that now haunts Allison Road. Do you dare to travel alone on this stretch of road at night? Or any stretch of road that is deserted and dark? Was this true horror story real or not? You know what to do, that five star review. Or you can swing by YouTube to comment and like. Now, if you want to get more personal and scare me with your tales of horrors, take a ride on the wild side and share them on my subreddit, True Horror Podcast. Until next time, remember that sometimes things you see in the shadows are more than just shadows. <laughs>